Welcome uh, to the second day of this uh, um, Centre for Intelligent uh, Sensing Summer School. Um, I'm, uh, uh, as had teacher said, I'm uh, Mark Plumley from the Centre for Digital Music. Uh, now I notice in the programme that most of the uh, stuff in uh, in this summer school is not about audio. So I just wanted to get a sense of the background of people here before I started. So maybe you could just give me uh, a bit of a hands up if you have uh, background in or interest in audio or music. Okay, uh, how about vision? Um, something else? Anybody want to shout out something that's not included in any of those? Um, chemical sensing, Matt? Language. Language. Any other things that we haven't covered? Okay, well, that'll do for the moment. So um, I'm not going to go into much of the technical detail at the moment, but so what I'm going to do is to give you a bit of an overview of some of the types of techniques and interesting things that we're looking at in uh, the music and audio side. And if you're interested in any of these, then come and talk to me or other people, and I'll give you some pointers to some people that are... Are here. I'll try and keep it a little bit short so the programme can get back to time for 11 o'clock. Um, so what I'm going to really be talking about today is about um, separating out sounds uh, using source separation methods, uh, extracting musical notes if you're listening to notes in a piece of music, what you can do with that, uh, following beats if you've got music with a, a beat in it, how you follow along with those, and some of the tools that we've got for visualising and manipulating those. And then towards the end, I'll talk uh, about an interest that we've got uh, increasingly working on, about non-speech, non-music signals, so things like birdsong uh, and environmental sounds, those couple of things we've been doing recently. OK, there are lots of people on, on here that have done the work behind this. Uh, so... Uh, this, this, this is just an idea of some of the people that I've been working with over the years, and there are more names to add to the bottom here. And uh, funding comes from various places like EPSRC, Leave You Trust, and so on. Um, now, those of you that are here, are most of you from Queen Mary, or are there any people not from Queen Mary? Okay, two or three from not from Queen Mary, others, others from here. So... Um, I just want to give you a, a very quick overview of the Centre for Digital Music that was mentioned. So I have an overlapping interest both in the Centre for Intelligent Sensing um, and the Centre for Digital Music. In digital music, um, we're really concentrating not just on the sensing side of things, but anything to do with digital technologies for uh, music and audio. Um, it's uh, quite a big research group of about 55-odd people, including about 10 academics or so on. Um, and... Uh, with a wide range of um, any interests and software and working with people like BBC um, and, uh, and so on. We've also got some undergraduate programmes here. Um, if you're looking out for some faces, Matt will be uh, on here uh, soon. Um, uh, but, uh, but also, here's a range of the, the sort of people working here. But what I wanted to point out in terms of the things that we're working on Lots of things like augmented instruments, performance studies, mathematical models of music are not so relevant to this. But the things that are relevant here are the topics of machine listening and audio engineering. So Josh Rice in the audio engineering side is also uh, connected with the Centre for Intelligent Sensing here. So this is the stuff that I'm going to concentrate on, on today. So let's have a look at separating out mixed sounds. You can just about... Uh, uh, make out the, the people on there. This is the sort of thing called the cocktail party problem. Okay, so you imagine you're in this cocktail party. This actually isn't a cocktail party, it's a conference that we had here uh, a year or so ago. Um, but if you're in a cocktail party or some other sort of party, you can talk to people in front of you. Sometimes, okay, you get visual cues from being able to look at uh, word, lip reading, if it's particularly noisy, but you can separate out the things that you want to listen to from the other stuff going around, even if actually the interesting conversation is the one going on over here while you're pretending to talk to somebody in front of you. Um, so the very simple version of this that we're trying to get to is a very simple version where we've got two speakers and 
two microphones that might pick that, pick that up, so your two ears. So in a very, very simple case, uh, we might have two sources speaking something not very interesting. One, two, three, four. Okay, and, uh, and I think you can guess. That. Uno, dos, tres. And so you get a sort of mixture. Uno, One, two, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. So this is not hard maths what's going on here. We're just doing simple matrix multiplication to add pathways to these two. This is the very simplest version, by the way. We can you know, get more complicated versions by the time we want to add delays and so on. But the key thing is that we want to work out how we're going to un- mix those sources when we only hear this and we don't know what the mixture is. So we're given this X, this sequence of mixtures, we want to get back to the original sources without knowing what A is. If we knew A, we could just simply do a matrix inversion, multiply on the front, problem solved. But we have to work out how we're going to estimate what that is. Now that's a bit tough to start with, so we can start. We can go to a different sort of visualization. And imagine that instead of it was sound sources, you've got die rolls. So simple uh, numbers between one and six. We've got some examples here. With we can add you know, half of A and three of B and two of A and one of B. This can be our different mixtures. And visually, if we plot out what happens, we just get to see these numbers as the things that we measure, but we need to be able to get back to the mixtures. Now, if I plot that on a graph, this is the sort of thing that we see. So, the mixtures, we can now see visually how the mixtures have been mixed in here. So, without being told what the mixing matrix is, we can actually look at these edges and work out where that is. So, these tell us what the mixing matrix is. Now this is fine to do visually, but actually if we can do this, this gives us a chance of being able to undo that mixing process. If we can work out what the parallel lines are, we work out what the slopes are here, and these slopes tell us what the original mixes were that were being used. So this is very common in sensing problems. Your sensors pick up mixtures of stuff but you don't know how they were mixed. You could imagine that you had um, chemical plants emitting different sorts of chemicals. You pick them up, but you don't know what the mixtures are. You just know you're picking up mixtures of chemicals from different plants that are emitting things. In sounds, we've got these examples where you've got different mixtures of sounds. In image, if, we, if you were able to overcome the occlusion problem, um, maybe you have, have translucent uh, images, then you could get mixtures of things as well. Sometimes that happens if you've got, say, uh, photocopies of very thin paper where you've got stuff on the back and the front. You can get different sorts of mixtures from there. So this is actually um, now easy to do, and the technique that, that is used here is a technique called independent component analysis, or ICA. And basically it relies on the fact that the original sources are statistically independent, and we can turn this into a method, which I don't need to go into here, but you can look up if you're interested in it. And there are packages that you can run that will do that separation. And so from that, you can then separate out the original audio sources. One, from here. two, three. OK, so this is a very simple and straightforward version of something that you can do here. The key thing that this relies on is that you have the same number of microphones as you have original sources. So as long as you've got that and your mixing matrix is square, then you've got a chance to be able to find out what the mixing matrix is and do the inversion from there. The more difficult problem that we often have is where there are more mixed sounds. So imagine this time that we've got a musical mixture where you've got several instruments being mixed together but picked up by only two microphones. So in this example, we've got a couple of different guitars. That's one, second one here. And some percussion. And the mixture that we get sounds like this.
pointer? Okay, so if we then look at what the scatter plot looks like this time, we can't clearly see where the three sources are in this mixture. We've got a 2D diagram, and before we had two edges, and we could easily find out where those are. This time we can't see those, so we can't extract them. So our simple independent component analysis technique can't be used for that. So how are we going to solve this? In order to solve this, we have to rely on some other information in the problem. So let's have a look in the, in the frequency domain. Um, so even those of you working in, in, um, in vision will be used to um, spatial frequency transforms. Uh, in case not, here we've got low frequencies down here, high frequencies up here. And if we look at this, in this particular case, it's a speech example. If any of you have done any speech recognition, you'll recognize this. She had your dark suit and greasy wash water all year. Don't ask me to... This is the, from the famous Timit, um, T-I-M-I-T, database, which people have been using for about 25, 30 years in speech recognition. Um, and, uh, but what you see from here is that the energy is concentrated in relatively small regions of this time frequency plot. So the large areas of dark um, and relatively few areas of high energy. And this is because the, the voicing is based on, uh, on the vocal tract vibrating, pulsing, um, and then being filtered. So the pulses give you um, harmonics that repeat at intervals of the voicing frequency here. Musical instruments will do the same sort of thing. Now, if we look at this type of representation where most things are zero and a few things are non-zero, this uh, is called a sparse representation. And this is one of the techniques that we use uh, quite a lot. Uh, it's also used in vision and other type problems, so some of you may already be using sparse representations techniques uh, as well. Now, how that changes things, if we go back to our die roll experiment, but this time we've got three die uh, uh, dice instead of, uh, uh, instead of just two. We could think of it as like a sort of two-stage thing where you know, there are some games where you have to throw a six before you can do anything. So imagine this is the sort of thing that you've got here. You have to throw a six before you can get a score, and then if you throw a six, you throw the next dice, a die, and that will tell you which score you get. Now, if that's the sort of thing that you've got, that would give you a sparse representation because you've got lots of zeros here and just a few non-zeros. And if you then plot that mixture, this is what you see. Almost everything is concentrated down here because you've got lots and lots of zeros. And just every so often, one of the die will win and be able to get a score. And so what you find is that the directions that correspond to the mixtures of the individual die will have a non-zero value. And occasionally you'll get a few scattered around here where two of the dice got a six before being able to score something. So this means that we can now visually see again where the different directions of the die are. Now, in the case of coming back to our audio example, we can do this in this spectrogram domain, this time frequency domain. And if we plot out the um, frequency transform of one of our microphones and the frequency transform of the other microphone, in this case the right and the left microphone, we can actually see here that there are these lines, you can see in the scatter plot, that correspond to the different directions that the sounds have come from. So again, in this case, this is a very simple example. If you know um, uh, about, um, about stereo mixtures, this would be simply pan-potted stereo mixtures, so we've, where you've just got different volume of each source and you've not got any problems with delay. But what that then allows us to do is to approximately recover this source just by deciding anything that appears in this cone we're going to allocate to one source. Anything that appears in this region to another source, that region to another source. And that allows us then to color in 
our spectrogram in different colours depending on the different sources that we think and the different directions of arrival. Occasionally we'll get this wrong because more than two sources are on at the same time, they're sort of competing for the same time frequency box and it won't quite work. But a lot of the time, particularly for the harmonic sources, that this will give us a, uh, a good result. So let's have a listen to some of the uh, example results here, just a reminder of the mixture that we've got. So you can hear yourself, there are three sources in there, but you might not be able to isolate them easily inside your head. But let's have a look at what the uh, algorithm does here. So you can hear it's got one of the instruments, but there's a little bit of something, a little thump something in the background that shouldn't quite be in there. Let's try the, the next guitar. So that's fairly clean, but if you listen to it carefully, it maybe doesn't have everything quite in it. It's not, it doesn't have quite the attack that maybe it used to have before. Uh, and let's try the, the percussion. Okay, so you can hear that it's got the percussion in there, but there's bits of drum leaking, sorry, bits of guitar leaking into there. It, actually, the percussion is a very difficult thing to separate because percussive instruments tend to be wide band. They're not very sharp in terms of harmonics, so they spread out all over the place in the frequency domain, and that means that they'll often crash into some of the other instruments. So essentially, this is picking up what's left over from those other instruments. But this is a good start. This is the starting point. Um, this type of method of working in the time frequency domain um, will be using methods like non-negative matrix factorization is one of the methods that uh, we'll extract from that. If you're interested in these type of techniques, then uh, come and uh, talk to me afterwards. Um, we can also get some more leverage by using side information here. So some recent things that we're working on uh, is to use score information. So sometimes you will actually know what the music is that's being played for that. If you can align the music with this, that can help you to say, okay, this is where that guitar is supposed to play, that's where those drums are supposed to play. And that can help you to decide which things should go to which instruments. Okay, so we've looked at some of the problems of source separation. They're actually very widely applicable uh, so many of these type of techniques, either using independent component analysis or sparsity type techniques or non-negative matrix factorization will also have application uh, in vision and other types of sensing problems. Here I'm going to be uh, now looking at extracting musical notes where we want to recognize the notes that are being played in a score rather than just separating out the different pieces. So. Here we're looking at something where we start from some original score um, and this may be played on a um, what's sometimes called a piano roll type representation or MIDI uh, stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, I think. Um, and this is a way that was designed to communicate between keyboards and, uh, and synthesizers but will essentially tell you when a particular uh, note is being played. And if we just listen to um, this sequence of notes from here, so this is a, um, so you can hear most of the time in here we've got two notes being played at the same time. Now, if we listen to the audio from here, we need to start to do something to the audio to help us to be able to recover this. So this is the sort of representation that we're trying to get back to. But if we look at this in a, uh, a spectrogram, so time frequency representation here, um, we don't see these notes quite so easily here. We can see there's something in here, but we're also seeing all the harmonics. So each of the notes generates multiple frequencies at, um, multi at multiple of its fundamental frequency. So if you've got a note being played at, say, 200 hertz, then you've also got harmonics at 400, 600, 800, and so on. So 
our problem for music transcription, as it's called, is to try and get from this type of representation back to this one. So one of the things that we've been working on is using this sparse representations technique, again, in that if you have a piano, you've got many notes that you could play. You've got some 88 notes on a, on a full piano. But when you're playing something like this piece, you're only playing a small number of them at once. And again, this is a very common situation that arrives in many sensing situations. There are lots of things that you could be looking for, but very few of them are happening at the same time. So can we use this leverage in order to recover the notes from the um, spectrogram that we're looking for? And in a sense, we're trying to get from the original audio to a, as sparse a representation as possible in the hope that actually that's going to give us something meaningful about the thing that's going on. So if we look at the audio uh, signal here, if we just expand out some of this, this has got very few zeros. Most of the time this is non-zero. So this is really not a sparse representation at all. It's a long way from being sparse. If we simply do a perform a spectrogram in here, so this is where we've essentially taken one frame, turned it into a, a frequency domain representation here, then we've got something that's much closer to being sparse. We've got a few large values in here that normally correspond to the harmonics of the notes, so the multiples of the fundamental frequencies of the notes that we've got, but lots of sort of near zero things in between those. So this is much closer to being sparse than this is. What we want to get to is this sort of situation. This is the piano roll that we showed at the beginning. This is our target. And here we've got two non-zero values and everything else is zero. So in comparison, this is really very sparse. And this is what we're trying to get to. So could we automatically do that step to go from here to here? So this is some work um, that I've uh, been doing with Sama Abdallah. Uh, this is now um, so quite some old work from when we arrived uh, about um, uh, 10 years ago. But um, the principle here is that we start from this spectrogram and apply a sparse decomposition method. So something that is a bit like, if you think about the independent component analysis thing that we were trying to do before, where you've got this measurement X and you're trying to break it down into two sources uh, a mixing matrix and our source is S. In the independent component analysis method, these things were supposed to be independent, and that's the thing that allowed you to find out what your mixing matrix is. This time our driver is slightly different. This time we're saying the sources, we want those to be as sparse as possible. So find out what this mixing matrix is that's given these sparse things. And the idea is that what we're looking for is from this time frequency representation to find a set of sparse notes and the frequency content of each note so that when you mix them together, you end up with what things are playing at different frequencies. So what the result of running this sparse decomposition method is that we get a piano roll-like representation like this where we've got note activations, approximately, and a series of, for each note, we've got the harmonic content of each one of these. Now, in this method, we didn't tell it anything musical. We didn't tell it that we were looking for harmonically related notes in here. We just let the sparse decomposition method look for this thing being as sparse as possible. So the initial results that we got uh, from this um, uh, are, are very promising, but a lot of work has gone on since then. So let's, let's hear this example. Um, if you're musical, you might want to sort of plug your ears a bit because this is a synthesized harpsichord, so it doesn't really sound very great. Okay, so you get the idea of... So... Um, the reason we use the synthesized harpsichord in, in this uh, early experiment is that synthesized instruments are much more repeatable, so you're more likely to be able to get the recovery to work. Um, 
Also, the harpsichord has a very sharp onset and decays very quickly, so therefore its notes are more likely to be represented by one vector, whereas more realistic instruments sort of change over time. Um, but in this case, the result that we get got out from here, the only musical thing that had to be done at this stage was essentially to reorder the components, because there's nothing in here that says what order the components should come out with. So we had to reorder the components into a note order, and then this was replayed on a synth synthesized piano. So you can hear what the algorithm thought the result was. If I can get my points back, here we go. Okay, so you get the idea that it's got the notes in there somewhere. They're not necessarily timed very well. There are one or two that are missing. But actually, it's done a pretty good job for something that didn't know anything about the music. Now, since then, there's been a lot of work in the group on refining this. Uh, if you use a lot of musical knowledge, you can get much better results than this. But I think one of the things that I think is interesting in this, in a general sensing point of view is that this principle of looking for a sparse decomposition is something that's applicable to a wide range of problems, particularly if it's something that you don't know about your problem. So um, now this is really, uh, these days would be called sparse dictionary learning. So if you're interested in this, look up dictionary learning for sparsity. There are more modern dictionary learning methods. Some of you, if you're using sparse representations, may have come across the KSVD algorithm, and so on. So these are the sorts of things that will find representations from a mixture. Um, and if you think that you're sensing something and it comes from something that's sparse, has a lot of non-zeros, then this is the type of technique that you can use to attach, attack this. It's also related to the method of uh, non-negative matrix factorization, or NMF, where you use the fact that these two things are um, non-negative, and that can also give you a lot of leverage. So there are a lot of these generic techniques that can actually be used even if you don't know what the structure of the problem is uh, that you're dealing with. Okay, so, so far I've looked at things where you've been looking at pretty much a static frame at a time, but a lot of musical information comes from the timing, uh, particularly things like um, beat tracking. So quite a bit of the work in our group has been looking at following and actually predicting where the beats happen in music. So um, here, the technique that we're using will often split the problem of beat tracking into uh, two uh, problems, one after the other. First is to look at how much the audio signal changes. So depending on the type of music that you've got, there's often a, a big energy change at the beginning of every onset. So you can use an onset detector for that. And then you can look for regularity in this at different stages. I'm not going to go into the technical details here, um, but it does allow you to put um, regular beats on top of here. So this is the sort of example um, from work with, uh, with Matthew Davis, who's now in Porto. So the cowbell on the top is... Uh, is produced by the algorithm, um, but you get the sense that much of the music has this regular structure along to it. Um, and this can then be used in a, um, a few different applications in music um, in terms of things like just finding out what the beat rate is in something. It might help you if you want to dance along with something. Um, uh, dance music classification, for example, um, if you're dancing to a foxtrot or a cha-cha or something, then actually there's quite a restricted range of beat rates that you can dance to for that particular piece of music. Um, and it may depend on how tall you are, which ones you're comfortable with. So uh, one of the, the fun applications uh, of this, though, is, uh, is one in rhythm transformation. Uh, so this is one where, as well as just looking at the regular beats, we're also looking at the patterns of beats within... Um, within, the, uh, within the bars here and we're able to morph 
one to another. So just to give you an example of this one, uh, here's a, an, an original, um, pretty straight. So the regular beats in here, you can sort of, you know, almost go put a fast metronome for this one. Okay, here's something of a very different style you might recognize. So very not regular in terms of them with a, with a reggae feel to that. And we can morph the first one into the, the beats of the second to, to get this type of result. So I'm not sure the original artists would have been happy with that, but uh, you know, you could say that there's a, there's there maybe an improvement there. Uh, so this is something where there's a uh, there's a, a Mac app uh, out at the moment with a company Lickworks that's using uh, this, uh, so that you can uh, have a play with it yourself if you like. Um, um, the our uh, researcher Andrew Robertson has been also using beat tracking in a live context. Uh, so here the application is that. If you are a band using uh, a backing track uh, based on a computer, then usually you have to get your drummer to wear a set of headphones and follow along to a click track set by the computer, because otherwise the band is not going to stay in time with the backing track. So Andrew's idea is to turn this round the other way so that the computer listens to the drum beats that the drummer is producing and instead follows along with that and speeds up or slows down um, the, uh, uh, the timing of that from here. So here's an example uh, video that we've got just to give you an idea of that. Now, the setup here is that this is a, a robot glockenspiel by Dave Meakin on the Media and Arts Technology Programme. You can feel it's sped up very slightly here. I'll run forward a little bit. You can now feel it's much faster. And when it finishes, so this is just it, it finishing. Okay, so it will carry on if you, if the drummer stops. It will carry on at the last uh, uh, last thing from there. So uh, I think that's uh, Dave. Uh, yeah. Um, so Dave knock on the drums there, and Dave Meekins robot glockenspiel for that. So uh, if you'd like to know more about that, then uh, Andrew Robertson, who's a, a Royal Academy of Engineering EPSRC fellow here, is the person to talk to about that. So um, I think actually I'll skip this one just to keep to time. Uh, there's some work that we've been doing on information theory and music prediction. Um, if any of you are interested in that, that's uh, work with Samat Abdallah, who's now at uh, UCL. But um, uh, this is using the sort of models that uh, actually I'm interested in talking to Matt um, more about uh, um, how mu when you listen to music, you don't just let it wash over you but actually it's an active listening process. And one of the interesting things for us is how the note that you've just listened to now, what that tells you about the future that you didn't already know from the past. And um, just to, to go over very, very quickly, there could be some psychology sort of sensing interest in here because if, if things are too predictable, it's very boring, you don't want to bother to listen to it. If it's completely random, it's also boring because it's sort of meaningless. Somehow you want things in the middle where as the music plays it reveals itself and you want to keep listening to it to find out what's going to happen into the future. So this is something quite interesting I think that, uh, uh, that again if you're interested come and talk to me but it's something that we want to expand from music into other sorts of language and other artistic experiences uh, from here. So a couple of things about visualization. 
Um, if you're interested in getting into some of uh, the work on audio, um, then a very easy way in is one of our um, uh, software tools that we've got, um, something called Sonic Visualizer. Uh, you can Google it, spell it with an S um, rather than a Z, then you'll uh, find it better. Um, but the idea of this is that, that we've been using this to put our research methods as open source software so that as wide a range of people can use those as possible. Often we'll do work in MATLAB, but actually MATLAB is not something that everybody on the street has got, whereas lots of people have got a Mac or Windows or Linux or something. And so this is something that really uh, Chris Cannum um, has been working in our group to, um, to implement this. There's also a plug-in uh, system for this so that you can use it um, on a, a web interface as well. I'll uh, show this actually being demonstrated in a, in a minute with some uh, work on, on birdsong, but um, there's also a, just a short video here just to give you a bit of an idea of the sorts of things that you can do uh, with this uh, for music. <laughs> a little bit loud. Okay, so we're, what we're able to do is to look up a range of different plugins, in this case, tempo and beat tracker. And a segmenter. So all of these things are available either in that already or down, downloadable. You can hear a click, click, click in the background. Maybe I can get the uh, front row off here so you can see things a bit better. So the segmenter has tried to now split this into different sections correspond to different segments. So here's one of the segments here. And we can go forward to a similar point and we can hear the same thing again. And we can also change the speed without changing the uh, without changing the pitch. So this could be very useful if you've got a very fast recording and you want to slow it down to hear what the. Okay, I think that's uh, I think that's enough of that. So if you're uh, uh, if that's something of interest to, to you, then uh, have a go and download that. Uh, so that you can play around with the huge number of options that you've got in that. There are also some tutorials on the website, so you can uh, play about with that if you like. Uh, okay, I'll skip the harmonic visualizer so that you can... Um, there is work that we've been doing on manipulating sounds as well, but what I want to come on to just for the last part of this is to look at some work on uh, so-called non-speech, non-music sounds. Uh, within the field of audio... There's a field of speech recognition that's been going on for you know, 70 years or something, looking at how, how do you encode and recognize speech. Music information retrieval has been a field around for uh, maybe 14 years or so now, and there are conferences in that. We've hosted a couple of the conferences. But there isn't so much of a community in the area of things which are not speech sounds and not uh, music sounds. Um, there are one or two like bioacoustics communities in there, and uh, one of the workshops um, that Dan uh, is organising in a couple of weeks' time will be on bringing together the artificial um, and and biological signal processing in a, in a workshop on the 26th. Is it Dan? 25th. Thank you. 25th of June, called "Listening in the in the Wild." Um, but one or two of the things that we've been looking at is how we can apply these techniques that we've applied to music to other types of sounds. So one of these, uh, which was done on a, a visit from uh, Fabio Hedialblu and Miguel uh, Coimbra in Portugal, uh, is how to separate heart sounds. So if you listen to a, to a heart sound, you'll hear a sort of boom, boom sound. But actually what's going on here, I'll just uh, rewind this to play the visualisation, is that you're actually getting two processes 
which mean that these two valves open at slightly different times on the inlet, and these two valves open at slightly different times at the outlet. So actually there are two valves closing here, and there are two other valves closing here. Now, if you're a frontline um, doctor, GP, it's actually very difficult to hear which of the valves is making those different sounds from there. So the idea from Miguel Coimbra, he approached us to see could we apply some of our source separation technology uh, to try and, um, and solve uh, this. So could we separate, for example, the um, aortal from pulmonary um, sounds in here, the A2 and the P2 uh, sounds. So what uh, people have done before um, is take a four-headed stethoscope and stick it on the heart. The valves are in slightly different places, so therefore some will be closer to others. And we can use the independent component analysis method that we talked about at the beginning in order to do that separation. But if you're a GP or if you're in a, uh, an A&E unit of a hospital, you're not going to carry out around a sort of octopus-looking four-headed stethoscope with you every day. But what you might do is carry around a normal stethoscope that's got a little microphone inside and a Bluetooth transmitter. And those are manufactured already, sometimes for training purposes. So instead, our idea was to use the fact that the heart sound repeats and pretend that we had several microphones by measuring the heart in four different places, which is normal process for doctors to, to do, and then take those and line them up as if they were recorded at the same time. So we take these separate recordings, line them up here. So uh, let me just turn the volume up very sl slightly here because it's, it's at, the heart sound is very low frequency, so we're going to try and, and hear what sound is that we've got here. Okay, so... So that's one of the standard heart sounds. After processing, we were able to get a little bit where you should be able to hear the second heart sound separated a little bit from there. Uh, where's my pointer? It may sound just the same to you, but actually the second one, you may be able to hear there's a more of a ba-dum, ba-dum. Badum, badum sound. So there, there are two sounds at the, at the uh, second one. So this was some initial, uh, initial work uh, that happened during the, the visit of Fabio Hedaioglu. He then had to leave, finish off his PhD, but we've got a new uh, master's student just working over the summer who's going to pick up this project again and see if we can uh, get this working uh, again. Uh, there are lots of practical difficulties here. The when, when you breathe in and breathe out, the gaps between the heart sounds change, so they're not exactly the same. Every heartbeat is slightly different. There's lots of background noise. All of these sorts of things mean that there was a lot of human intervention in terms of this lining up. And so we would really try and want to try and recognise that so that we can pull things out. Also, we want to introduce as few artefacts as possible, because if you're trying to listen for a problem in here, for example, the heart valve not closing completely. So instead of getting a nice boop, you get a sort of boof sound where there's still uh, flow going through. That's the sort of thing you're trying to pick up. And so we don't want to introduce artifacts or artificially clean up things because you might clean up the stuff that you're actually listening for. Um, so some other work that Dan's been working on for a, for, um, a year or two now is on uh, birdsong um, segmentation and clustering. This is some work uh, actually also within the, the sonic visualizer. Where's my sonic visualizer uh, here? So, so this is um, Skylark, I think, Dan. Uh, let's let's. Okay, uh, that bit. Let, let's just try that back from the beginning. Okay, so here you've got. One skylight recording, but there are lots of different syllables, lots of different shapes of sounds that the skylight will make in, in, in here. So one of the early bits of work that Dan was working uh, on was how you could cluster the different syllables um, together 
um, and use that to pick up where the repeating patterns are to see if we can uh, either um, uh, recognize those or uh, here we can see that we've got some some of the different structures with the same label. So here we've got um, the symbol 12 appears. If we zoom in on that, we can see that here we've got a particular shape of a slightly rising um, syllable here. If I go over to the next time that, that that appears here, we've got another one here. So we've got the same sort of shape appearing for this one, but with different symbols over here. Um, if I uh, we what so what Dan has done here is just labelled some of those in Sonic Visualizer. I can select to constrain the playback to the selected areas and repeat the selected areas. And so if I do that, you can see it cycling through the different. Um, examples of the same segment and they should sound sort of similar to each other roughly so you can sit here that each one of those is sort of similar to the others um, whereas very different to if I undo the constraint so there are a wide range of other syllables that you can that you can get now one of a couple of the interesting things about bird song is that Unlike speech, there tend to be a lot of gaps between the syllables. And if you've got several birds going on at the same time, then you want to be able to track um, each of the separate birds, even though there are gaps between those. And so one of the things that, that um, uh, Dan's been working on is a Markov renewal process where you're able to look at, here's a syllable from one bird here, can you match it forward to when the next syllable uh, is, um, is emitted? And if you've got another one going along at the same time, can you match the paths through this sort of graph of symbols? Also, if you look at the um, zoom into the time frequency resolution here, it's, it's sort of fuzzy. And it's not just because I've zoomed in and it's blurred. It's because this is the limits of our uh, time frequency representation in here. So are there other representations that we can use, chirp-like representations, in order to track these, where we're actually specifically modelling the fact that it's a, um, a, a frequency changing in time. So that's actually quite a challenge for time frequency representations themselves. So I think um, one of the things that we think is that birdsong is one of those things that can be really interesting for signal processing researchers to look at, to look at the fundamental properties of time frequency representations that you need to be able to um, investigate. So just to finish off on some work on environmental sounds, this is uh, some uh, quite recent work on a data challenge that we were organising. Uh, so we wanted to do some work in uh, recognising audio scenes and events. But actually often you go to a conference, you talk to people, and they say, and we say, oh, is your data available? And they'll say, oh, sorry, we, uh, we did this with a company and that's not available, or... Uh, well, we got this from the BBC Sound Effects CD, so it's sort of made up sounds rather than real sounds. So this is something that we uh, worked on. Uh, so Dimitris Janoulis, one of my PhD students, was, was leading on this, and, and Dan and Menion Benitos, who's now at, uh, at City, um, and uh, a couple of people from uh, IRCAM in Paris. So the idea was to uh, record audio scenes, things like street, supermarket, restaurant, tube station, and also, within an office environment, particular events. So, uh, a pen dropping onto a table, somebody coughing, uh, the printer running, a door knock. These sorts of things that you might want to recognise in an office environment. And present these two as challenges that people could submit some data to. Uh, the submission closed on 31st of March. We've done the analysis now. The results will be presented um, at the WASPA conference in, in 2013, so although I know them and we know them, we can't give them away at the moment because they're going to be announced then. Uh, but just to give you a bit of an idea of, of, uh, of some of the work, the, the baseline system that... Uh, Dan, was this your baseline system here? Yeah. Um, so here, this is based on a so-called bag-of-frames model. So this is... It's a very common thing for, for recognising sort of musical genres and so on. The idea is that you take your time frequency distribution, you take all the frames, 
you analyze some sort of features. In this case, we're using male frequency kepstrel coefficient. So if you want to know what that is, it, uh, come and talk to me. It doesn't really matter. It could be just frequency components. And you chuck all of those vectors into a bag and lose the order, but just look at the distribution. And then you use a Gaussian mixture model uh, classifier. So each of the classes is modeled by a number of Gaussian distributions, and then you use those to try and estimate which is the most likely class for the particular sample that you look at. And these are the type of results that, that we get from here. So, so this is a confusion matrix. Um, so for bus, for example, it seems to be pretty reliable. Um, things that are less reliable are things like quiet street and park are easily confused. But that's maybe not surprising, because in both cases there's not very much going on down here. Uh, restaurant and supermarket um, look sort of similar as well. So, I mean, these are sorts of things that, 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 can, uh, that can happen here. So I think this, is, this was the baseline system, um, but um, there were... Um, something like 14 systems altogether, or 14 entries being being um, uh, being entered, and there's a huge range of different uh, um, different systems um, in terms of what classification, what feature extraction was being used, um, and also, well, most of them were in MATLAB. We did work hard to present them with a virtual machine so that people could submit a Python version. We knew that we could run that. So we gave them a virtual machine that we would then run locally, but only two entries used Python um, out of that. Um, and I think one of the MATLAB examples also um, installed their MATLAB onto our virtual machine, uh, which causes some licensing issues, but that's, that's still there. Um, but that is interesting. So this is something that, that, uh, that we're going to be presenting all the full results of this at the uh, workshop on applications of audio to uh, signal processing uh, in New York State in October. Uh, if you want to know more about that, then have a look at the Scenes and Events Challenge uh, website and watch this space for more information. Okay, so I've sort of overrun very slightly. Um, just to conclude, there's a huge amount of stuff that we're interested in, audio and analysis, for music and beyond music, um, and also for visualisation and separation. I think there are lots of interesting things from our perspective in terms of the fact that digital media is now everywhere. So from a music perspective, you don't need to buy music anymore. You subscribe to Spotify or something. It's, you've got millions of things that you could listen to, uh, radio services. Um, but the non-speech, non-musical audio, I think, is a, an interesting aspect of what's coming out from this too. So from a sensing perspective, I think there are many interesting general properties in here that can be used for... Time, uh, time sequences. Um, even sometimes you might be able to solve things using audio where you thought you might have to use video. So the uh, Trek vid multimedia event detection task, which is one of how do you classify videos of things like getting a car unstuck or birthday party or baking a cake. Actually, the audio information can tell you quite a lot about that. And it might be that those sort of tasks... Think about using the audio information as you, if you've got it, because it might help you to solve problems that actually are quite difficult to solve from the video perspective. Okay, so I think at that point I'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>